Good afternoon, everyone. Virgo here. It is June 18th, 2019, and I'm doing this video after waiting for about six months um, because I had challenged myself to ask a specific question of at least 50 people, something that has been disturbing me since I actually started this channel, and that is... Why is it that all of these people that either fall into these scams with this sovereign citizen ideology or actually start their own scams all say the same one thing? And that is, I hate the Federal Reserve. Now, the thing is, is that I can understand the concern with regards to the Federal Reserve. I can understand the concern with regards to any government entity in reality. It's an area that people don't really get to put their footprint in too much. Um, anything that is kind of guarded by some form of secrecy, secrecy whether it's necessary or not, can seem ominous okay we'll say that and so my I set out trying to find out the reasons behind why they felt that they hated the Federal Reserve it was for my own understanding and then I realized something I was getting more and more irritated with this exercise we'll call it and I had to sit back and think about why was this something that was making me infuriated? Under normal circumstances, I have pretty much everlasting patience for people. But one of my biggest pet peeves is to make a claim that you dislike or distrust or have disdain for something and you don't know why. I asked a total of 56 people why it is that they disliked the Federal Reserve. And the majority of the answers that I got were answers that suggested that they didn't know what the Federal Reserve did, what the Federal Reserve governed, or who or what governed the Federal Reserve. They started making statements like, because it's owned by the elites, because it's run by um, the Illuminati, because it is owned by the same four families or six families or eight families, whatever the story was, as the news networks, spewing out information that is so false, it's not even, I mean, it's just ridiculous. So I had a couple of people that brought up some interesting points. And those points are the ones that I'm going to be going over today. I'm going to be going over these points because it became blatantly obvious to me that nobody knows what they're talking about. And the people that are following channels that talk about the Federal Reserve hate the Federal Reserve because of a conspiracy theory and not for a really good reason to hate the Federal Reserve like you'll find out in this video. It's funny that people think the Federal Reserve is owned by a group of families. And it's funny that people think that the Federal Reserve is not governed by anything. It's also funny that when I ask them, why is it that you're not angry with the OCC if you're angry with regulations having to do with the banks? And you know what answer I got 
from 55 of the 56 people that I asked online, who is the OCC? When I informed them that the OCC was the office of the comptroller of the currency, you know what they said to me? 54 of the 56 said, who is that? We're going to be going over some things today, including the pros and cons of deregulating the banks and give out some real, actual fact and true information instead of conspiracy theories, which is basically all I'm able to find across all of YouTube. The first thing we're going to address is who owns the Federal Reserve, and there's more than one reason for that. Not just the conspiracy theories having to do with the Illuminati and the rich elites and the families of the Rockefellers and Rothschilds that go on all over YouTube and all over social media that give you false information with regards to this, but also the claim that it's a private entity, the same as any store that you walk into that's owned by mom and dad, or a, co a corporation that is um, like any other corporation out there. No, that's incorrect. So those of you that decide to blow the whistles and make the claims and ring the bells and, you know, grab your pots and pans and start banging them, oh, it's a private entity, it has nothing to do with the government, you're dead wrong. We're going to talk today about the Federal Reserve and who owns it. The Federal Reserve System is actually not owned by anyone. You heard it right. It's not actually owned by anyone. Parts of the Federal Reserve System share some characteristics with private sector entities. The Federal Reserve was established to serve the public. The Federal Reserve derives its authority from Congress which created the system back in 1913 with the enactment, of course, of the Federal Reserve Act. This central banking system has three very important features. Number one, a central governing board, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Number two, a decentralized operating structure of 12 Federal Reserve Banks. And number three, a blend of public and private characteristics. Now, for those of you that really want to know who owns the Federal Reserve and why it is done this way, listen up. Okay, because honestly, again, one of my pet peeves. I don't really care. It doesn't fit my narrative. I'm going back to watch the conspiracy theories. If that's what you're going to do, then don't twaddle on, run in your mouth, acting like you know something. Let's actually learn something here so that maybe you can make an informed decision for yourself instead of following a group of idiots that don't know anything. The Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. is an agency of the federal government, the board appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Did you hear what I said? The board is appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. It provides general guidance for the Federal Reserve System and oversees the 12 reserve banks. The board reports to and is directly accountable to Congress, but unlike many other um, actual public agencies, it is not funded by congressional appropriations. So, um, Congress sets the goals for monetary policy, decisions of the board, and the Fed's monetary policy setting body, the Federal Open Market Committee, about how to reach those goals and does not require approval by the president or anyone else in the executive or legislative branches of government. Some observers mistakenly consider that the Federal Reserve is a private entity because the reserve banks are organized similarly to private corporations. For instance, each of the 12 reserve banks operates within its own particular geographic area or district 
of the United States, and each is separately incorporated and has its own board of directors. Commercial banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System hold stock in their district's reserve bank. However, owning reserve bank stock is quite different from owning stock in a private company. The reserve banks are not operated for profit and their ownership of a certain amount of stock is by law a condition of membership in the system. In fact, the Federal Reserve Banks are required by law to transfer any net earnings that they have to the U.S. Treasury after providing uh, for all necessary expenses of the Reserve Banks, legally required dividend payments, and maintaining a limited balance in a surplus fund. Okay, now let's talk about the truth about the banking supervision part of the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve System supervises and regulates a wide range of financial institutes, in, institutions and activities. The Federal Reserve works in conjunction with other federal and state authorities to ensure that financial institutions safely manage their operations and they also provide fair and equitable services to customers. Bank examiners also gather information on trends in the financial industry, which helps the Federal Reserve System meet its other responsibilities, including determining monetary policy. Let's talk about how a bank earns profit. This is going to be important because when I go into the pros and cons of deregulating banks, you're going to need to know this information. Just like any other business, a bank earns money so that it can run its operations and provide services. First, uh, the customers deposit their money in a bank account. The bank provides safe storage and pays interest on the customer's deposits. The bank is required to keep a percentage of its deposits in reserve as cash in its vault or in an account at the Federal Reserve Bank. The bank can lend the rest to qualified borrowers. Potential borrowers may wish to buy a house, a car, or just have a personal loan of some sort. However, they may not have enough money to pay the full price at one time. So instead of waiting and saving the money to pay for a new house, which could take years or maybe never at these uh, prices, they take out a loan from the bank. Borrowers are charged interest on the loan, a bank's primary source of income. Banks also make money from charging fees for other financial services, such as debit cards, automated teller machines, usage and overdraft on checking accounts. We've all been victim of that. So let's talk about safety and soundness. Two major focuses of, the, of uh, banking supervision and regulation are safety and soundness of financial institutions and compliance with consumer protection laws. To measure the safety and soundness of a bank, an examiner performs an on-site examination review of the bank's performance based on its management and financial condition and its compliance with the regulation. The examiner uses the CAMELS rating system to help measure the safety and soundness of a bank. Each letter stands for one of the six components of a bank's condition, capital, adequacy, asset quality, management, earnings, liquidity, and sensitivity to market risk. Okay, when performing an examination to determine a bank's CAMELS rating, instead of reviewing every detail, the examiner evaluates basically the overall health of the bank and the ability of the bank to manage its own risk. A simple definition of risk is the bank's ability to collect from borrowers and meet the claims of its deposit depositors. So a bank that successfully manages risk has clear and concise written policies. It also has internal controls such as separation of duties. Um, for example, a bank's management will assign one person to make loans and another person to collect the loan's payments. So the five G, the, or excuse me, the five C's is another thing that we can talk about here. A safety and soundness um, exam, a, a safety and soundness examiner 
also reviews a bank's leading activity by rating the quality a sample of loans made by the bank. When a bank reviews a loan application, it uses the five C's to access the quality of the applicant for the five C standards. You guys might have actually heard of something very similar to this. You usually only hear of the three C's, but this has actually five. Capacity, collateral, condition, capital, and character. Several federal and state authorities regulate banks along with the Federal Reserve, the Office of Comptroller of Currency, there's that ugly OCC again, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which of course is the FDIC, the Office of Thrift Supervision, the OTS, and the banking departments of various states also regulate financial institutions. The OCC charters regulates supervi and supervises nationally chartered banks, the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, the state banking authorities regulate state chartered banks, bank holding companies and financial services holding companies which have or have controlling interest in one or more banks are also regulated by the Federal Reserve and the OTS examines federal and many state chartered thrift, in thrift institutions which include savings banks and savings and loan associations. So we can talk about consumer protections, but I think everybody knows that the FDIC insures, which is part of the Federal Reserve, your funds when they're in a bank. And now what we're going to talk about is the pros and cons of deregulating the banks. So financial deregulation is known to have benefits which occur at a microeconomic level. Financial regulations are put into place, however, because they tend to have benefits on a microeconomic level. The trick is to find the right combination of regulations and to deregulate areas that are potentially harmful so that both economies can experience a maximum level of benefit. The end goal is really pretty simple, to give everyone the opportunity to ascend the ladder of socioeconomic success if that is what they wish to do. But let's talk about the pros and cons of financial deregulation. So I'm just going to give you some key points to consider on both sides because this is something that is widely misunderstood largely because people do not understand the structure of the banking system at all. Number one, it leaves businesses alone to fend for themselves. Under an atmosphere of financial deregulation, businesses would be allowed to determine their own operational processes. This gives them the authority to create their own uh, strategic imperatives with a minimal level of governmental interference. The end result is a business that can expand into new territories, of course, acquire new properties, access new markets without regulatory red tape that they have to go through now. So number two, it gives customers more choices. Yeah, I mean, that's a good thing. Deregulation makes it possible for any entrepreneur to create any business in virtually any industry. All they really need to do is um, have the financial backing in order to make that happen. There aren't any license quotas and can't stand in the way, uh, they can stand in the way of the uh, government obligations, which have to be met first, because there are more choices. Prices can be naturally regulated, so customers are forced to spend what companies may want them to spend. Let's talk about number three. It emphasizes the need for world-class service. Because there are multiple consumer choices in an economy with financial deregulation, companies are forced to provide world-class service in basically every facet of the business. Customers will pick and choose based on the overall value uh, position uh, so that a company with poor customer service will generally lose to the company with good customer service when all other aspects are similar. Number four, it creates more efficiencies within the deregulated industry. So when it is functioning properly, the deregulation helps consumers and businesses win because each sector becomes more efficient. Market forces are allowed to play out naturally to build and maintain relationships. B 
businesses can focus on their core strategies instead of focusing on making sure they have fulfilled all of their obligations under the regulations which are currently in force. Those are some pretty good pros. The problem is that there are some cons that come on the tail end of that that people don't seem to talk about very often. So let's talk about those cons. Number one, it eventually creates a system of financial winners and losers. So not everyone can be enormously successful in an economy fueled by financial deregulation. Eventually, someone comes out on top and begins to monopolize their industry, and over time this creates higher costs for consumers, less efficiencies, and ultimately less satisfaction because there was once a lot of choice and now there are very few choices because they've been monopolized on. So number two, it gives businesses power over the consumers. With or without regulations, businesses can essentially create products that consumers are forced to purchase. There will always be the power to not purchase goods or services in the hands of the consumer, but consider the actions of the Affordable Care Act. Consumers can choose to not carry health insurance in the U.S., but they will be taxed for that choice. So number three, profits become the number one point of emphasis at some point. These things you'll notice, they don't happen right away, but over time, they happen. People become, would become very irritated with the majority of these things. Financial regulations are put into place to support those who are at the lowest rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. In an, econom in, uh, excuse me, in an economy which features financial deregulation, profits become king. Businesses create goods and services that target their most lucrative cus customer base and price things out of range for those on the lowest rungs. In effect, the poor are totally ignored and the rich are doubted upon. Isn't that the one thing everybody complains about now? So deregulate the banks, this is what you will end up getting and it may not be in the first few months, first year, but pretty rapidly after that, you're going to see that this is what it creates. So let's go on to number four. This, there is no emphasis on personal responsibility whatsoever. So financial regulations also dictate how individuals and businesses are allowed to invest their cash. Without rules in place, the market allows virtually anything to happen. This means the rich will get richer, the poor will get poorer, because all of the opportunities are crafted by those who have power. In the world of financial deregulation, power only comes from the amount of money one has. The pros and cons of financial deregulation show that there must be some compromise in the microeconomic and microeconomic economies for mutual success to be found. Responsibility must be encouraged, and unfortunately, Responsibility means regulation. Now, that may be frustrating for some to hear, but not nearly as frustrating when you start taking away the conspiracy theories that are flat out lies and unproven by the majority of the channels on YouTube and a lot of the um, conspiracies that you find across the web on different financial websites that are not um, legitimate. They're just blogs or people's opinions or they have a political agenda behind them. There's reasons why regulations were put into place and it was a majority of individuals that chose those regulations, not the small group of cabal people that you have been told in these conspiracy places and channels uh, where they have told you this. We, the people, are the ones who vote. And I know that a majority of people believe that our vote doesn't matter, but that's actually not true. It does matter. And if we don't like something, we, the people, have the power to lobby in order to change it. And that is what has to happen. But before you go to lobby for something, 
You must thoroughly understand it because if you don't and you hop on something like the deregulate the banks um, train without understanding what could happen a year down the road and you're not one of those rich people, you're going to be very unhappy with the choice that you made and it won't be anybody's fault but your own. So oh, my final statement on this, who is the office of the comptroller of the currency? I'm going to tell you, um, give you some just basic information on this for those of you that don't know. And then I'm going to say research is required because truthfully, what you're getting online is a bunch of total and complete hogwash and bullshit. I could not believe that I searched YouTube and honestly could not find a video that didn't have at least one conspiracy when looking at the Federal Reserve. Unless it was on the Federal Reserve's own channel. This is not difficult, you guys. I mean, there's such a thing as a federal budget. You can order and you can read it. Funds are appropriated in specific places for a reason. And those things are tracked and they are on the public domain. You can see it with your own eyes. It's one of the things that's so hilarious about these so-called secret accounts. If they really existed, they'd be somewhere located within the federal budget of the last several years. But guess what? Nothing on the federal budget of it. Nothing. All these things that people want you to believe you're into some kind of secret knowledge. Well, honestly, there's not a lot of secret knowledge out there. There's only knowledge that you haven't run into yet and you personally don't know. But as far as secret knowledge, not really, no. The majority of everything can be located if you know where to look. And the next time somebody gives you a bunch of hogwash about something that supposedly is funded by the government, there is transparency when it comes to the actual um, budget. And you can look there. Try and find those secret accounts. <laughs> I guess to most that's going to just prove that they exist, right? Oh, well, nothing you can do about that. 40 years and still going to look for those accounts. Okay, here we go. What is the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC? So it is a federal agency that oversees the execution of laws relating to national banks. And specifically, it charters and regulates and supervises national banks and federal branches and agencies of foreign banks within the U.S., the comptroller of the currency appointed by the president is appointed by the president and approved by the Senate and heads the OCC. Works hand in hand in order to ensure that the Federal Reserve has checks and balances. The Federal Reserve and the OCC both um, work together to ensure that our banks have checks and balances. So why is it? that everybody hates the Federal Reserve but knows nothing about the actual um, Office of Comptroller of Currency that oversees the execution of laws that relate to the national banks. I just, I, I, my mind is blown that out of 56 people I couldn't find anybody who knew what the OCC was? Come on, you guys. You'd rather go watch a YouTube video that's three hours long slamming every alphabet agency they can find and giving you information like the Illuminati did it? When you can't find proof of something and somebody's telling you that there's some secret knowledge that if you just get in on this video, you're going to have it too, it's a scam. And you all should know that. Read up on what an actual con artist is. And that's what you find in the majority of these videos. Con artists, conspiracy theorists. And not every conspiracy is not true. 
Okay, there are some that are true, but when you can find, when it is absolutely transparent, when you can find the information yourself, it is your fault when you uh, vote on something and you end up paying for it later because you thought that that YouTube video was accurate rather than looking for yourself. Something that really gets under my skin and just irritates the heck out of me. I hope you guys found this useful. If you've got questions, please leave them in the comment section or email me at virgotriad at protonmail.com. And I will see you guys later. Bye-bye.